seminar this today and uh, appreciate so many of you. I know it had to be out a certain amount of experience of spending the night to be here. A lot of you in addition to that have driven a long way, so thank you very much. The title of this seminar is The Foolishness of Preaching. Now, that may uh, trigger a thought in your mind. I want you to turn back with me to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, to that particular source scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1, not verse 1, I'm sorry. I'll get myself organized. This, this is something I normally do at a sermon, by the way. I usually have my first scripture identified before I actually ask you to turn to it. I actually have it located. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, and verse, I'd say about verse 10 is where we want to start. Now, this is, this is critical for your understanding of where we're going and what we're going to be talking about and of what your responsibilities are if you're going to stand up in front of God's people and teach or preach. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. This is an astonishing admonition, frankly, because Paul had just as much experience as you and I have had with division and splits and arguments and the little personality things that oftentimes will cause troubles among people. It is astonishing in one sense of the word because it is presented to us as though he expects that we could accomplish it. I have watched people in many churches and many denominations uh, and I have never seen it accomplished. I have never seen it accomplished, not even in a church with a rigid authoritarian structure. Oh, you can inhibit people. You can even intimidate people from saying certain types of things. But you do not thereby accomplish a true unity of the heart and of the mind and the spirit. Paul goes on to say, For it has been declared unto me, uh, of you brethren, that uh, there are... I'm sorry, I got a little distracted here. We got a problem? Yeah. What is it? Oh, for the uh, plant for this mic? Yeah, for you. Okay. For your voice. Do we have everything on the tape? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Everything's okay over there. All right. He says, It has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, every one of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? You know, I don't know of any more consistent or persistent problem among Christian people than forming themselves into camps. And ironically, it almost always forms itself into camps around this or that or the other preacher. Now, it's a, it's a, a provoking concept when you think about it, because what I am here today to do is to exhort you to strive to be the best speaker that you possibly can be, the best preacher that you possibly can be. I'm not here today exactly talking about being a minister. For a man can be an extremely effective minister and be an absolutely terrible preacher. I've seen it in many cases before. In fact, and oftentimes, the, the two gifts seem to run in di totally different channels. That oftentimes some men who are among the very finest and most effective preachers and who can move people and change their lives are often not that effective as ministers. And by minister, I mean servants of the people. The man who shows up at the hospital to sit there beside your bed when you're, you know, not sure whether you're going to make it or not. The man who will come to your home when you're having trouble with a teenage son. The man who does the things that we oftentimes associate with a pastoral ministry. Sometimes those people will not wind up being the most effective preacher. One of the interesting concepts, frankly, I think, the most interesting concepts of the ministry that oftentimes I think have not been very adequately developed and Paul does develop it to some extent in the 12th chapter of this same book, is the concept of gifts and the differing gifts of the ministry. Men in the ministry oftentimes come under considerable criticism because they do not have one or the other of the gifts of the ministry. And people oftentimes do not understand that they don't have any right to expect a man to have all of the gifts of the ministry and that they should learn to accept those gifts that God has given to this particular man or that particular man with great gratitude and not expect him to be any more than they are in other areas, maybe not even as much as they are in other areas because of the simple fact that God's gift of hospitality might be given to you and not to another. 
God's gift of caring and helping may be given to you and not given so much to another. God's gift of visiting the sick, just like the gift of tongues, just like other gifts that we might name, can be given to one and not given to another. And who am I to complain that God has given me one gift and has not given me another? It's like uh, a pot or a vessel complaining, well, I was you, you glazed that one, but you didn't glaze me. I am uh, here unglazed and, and just earthenware. And this other one is highly polished and glazed. I can't, I can't argue the difference between those with the one who made me. And neither, of course, can any of us. He goes on to say, is Christ divided? Is that how we get her in this situation that you say, well, I am of Apollos. And you say over here, well, I am of Peter. And this fellow back here says, well, I am of Paul. And somehow or other, a leader, a preacher, has gotten to be the focal point of division in the church. Any preacher worth his salt is going to fight hard against allowing himself to become the object of the focus of people to the exclusion of other leaders, other preachers, other teachers. It's a serious mistake that we can make. He went on to say, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, because if I had, I am sure that someone would say that I had been baptizing in my own name. Well, he goes on to say, I, I didn't do that. He said, I baptized the house of Stephanus, and I'm not even sure whether I baptized anyone else down there or not. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Isn't that fascinating? Wouldn't you think every minister was called and sent out to baptize? Paul says he wasn't. He could do it, and he did it. He said, but God didn't call me to baptize. He called me to preach the gospel. Then he makes another astonishing statement. He says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now, how could that be? Can you tell me how that would be? Because, you see, here I am today calling upon you to do your absolute best in terms of choice of words, your style of delivery, your manner of presentation, to be all that you can be, to use the modern commercial expression, it's the army you're supposed to do that, isn't it? To be all that you can be. And yet here is the Apostle Paul said, now when I came in there and I came to preach, I was not preaching with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. So we find ourselves right here and now with a conundrum, with a problem. Because obviously I do not want to get up in the pulpit unprepared. I don't want to stand here having done no work, having not prepared or lined up my scriptures, with no particular concept or thought in my mind and speak to you because I know historically what the result of that is. It's a very, very poor effort. Maybe someone will be helped because God promises his word will not return to me void, but experience tells me that if I work hard, I can actually do more to help you than I can if I don't work at what I do, if I don't prepare, if I don't put out the effort. Now, Paul, though, on the other hand, seems to say that there is a conflict, and it's a conflict you must not ever forget between your skill, your wisdom with words, and the cross of Christ. And the, the, uh, the analysis is really a very simple one. When I get up here and I decide to give a sermon, I give a, give a speech to you about the cross of Christ, about the sacrifice of Christ, and about his death for you and what it accomplishes for you, what am I looking for? I am looking for in you an awareness of, of the fact that Christ died for you, an awareness of the forgiveness that is there for you, an awareness, awareness of the sacrifice that he made for you. I am looking for a response in you to Christ. And it is so easy for that response in you to be to me, because I'm the preacher. That's what we're up against as a preacher. It's what we must enter into our preparation with in our minds. We must start with the first notes at the top of our page, thinking in those terms that the objective of this sermon is not me. The objective of this sermon is not to turn people's thoughts to me. It is not that I should become a greater leader among these people. The objective of this sermon is that these people will see Christ more clearly, that they will feel Christ more closely, that they will experience Christ more definitively in their lives, that they will respond to him and not to me. 
That's what Paul means when he said, I, Christ sent me, to, not, not, to, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with wisdom or cleverness of words, because what must come out of this is the power that comes from the recognition of the death of Jesus Christ, because that is where the entire power of the Christian religion lies. It is in the death of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and my skills must not become in the way of your acceptance of that death for yourself. This is the problem. And yet, at the same time, Paul admits his work and how hard he worked. For he says, I labored more abundantly than they all. He had his nose to the grindstone. He pressed on. He kept at it. So we know that this man was not an unprepared man when he stood up to speak, but he was aware of the objective of his, of his sermon when he stood up to speak. He goes on then to say, For the preaching of the cross is to them who are dying foolishness, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, <clears throat> I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of, the God, of, God, of God, the world by wisdom did not know God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. The foolishness of preaching. And he said, frankly, to many people in the world, it is foolishness. It just seems like so much nonsense, and it seems like something they would not necessarily want to involve themselves in. And frankly, I think one of the reasons why many people in the world don't really much like to sit and listen to a sermon is, is because of some of the flaws and some of the things that have rendered ineffective the message and the preacher. In fact, in many cases, the people who sit and say, I don't really care to listen to this man anymore, have good reason for saying precisely that. For some rules are being broken. Some mistakes are being made. For one thing, Paul said it is through the foolishness of preaching that God has chosen to save those that believe. Now, we know that when you repent of your sins and you go into the waters of baptism, we know you are justified, don't we? That God forgives you. That is, all your past is gone and is over. Now, technically... I imagine most of you could explain to me and probably quote scriptures to me how that we are now justified and that we shall be saved in Christ. In other words, the ultimate salvation of a human being we all know is a future event. There are elements of it that are past. For example, even the awareness that God has forgiven you of your sins is a form of salvation and you can say, I have been saved. You can also, in fact, the New Testament speaks of, of salvation in three tenses. It says you have been saved, you are being saved, and you shall be saved. Always. So consequently, you begin to realize there's a bit more to salvation than merely a matter of uh, some event that takes place in your life. Now, Paul here says that the objective of preaching is to save those who believe. Save. Now, we know you've been justified and forgiven of your sins. But have you been saved from some of your emotional problems and your fears? Are you still afraid of something? Is there still something that threatens you personally and threatens your life? Could I then perhaps rescue you from that? And could we say that I had saved you from that? If Jesus Christ is able to save you from smoking, if Jesus Christ is able to save you from alcoholism, if he is able to save you from any number of other things that are going wrong in your life, is there not salvation still there for you? Now, I think many times when we get up to preach, we do not think in terms of it being a rescue mission. We think, for, for example, many preachers in the world would say that they're talking to a saved audience. Words, here's the church members. They're all here, and they're all saved. And, of course, maybe we've got a few people here who aren't saved, and so a preacher will get up on a Sunday night, and he'll preach a sermon about getting somebody saved, and there are only three people out there that aren't, by his definition. And by saving them, he is addressing himself purely to repentance and justification, getting rid of their sins. He is not addressing himself to the need for salvation of the 97% of the audience of his that is out there. 
who need to be saved from their night sweats, to be saved from lying awake half the night worrying about what's going to happen to them next month, next week, tomorrow, when their teenage boy goes into court, whenever, whatever it is that you face, that you need to be saved from, is facing you. In other words, the objective of a preacher is to extend a, a very present salvation to the people who are listening to him right now and about things that affect them right now to help them to find a way out of a burdened conscience that may be niggling and nagging at them and carrying, you know, and keeping them from being able to, to have a full and happy life. There's so many things that we could be saved of. He goes on then to say, it is by the foolishness of preaching that God has decided to save them that believe. And the fact of the matter is, since most of the things that we face are not things that someone else can do for us, the things that really worry us the most, they are struggles that we have got to meet ourselves, and the only way that we can be helped is by someone who will show us the way, give us the courage, encourage us on to it, help us to understand it, help us to deal with it, help us to accept it. This is the role of a preacher. He goes on to say, we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. It's foolishness to the Greeks. But to them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God, this foolishness of preaching, he says the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And that is so true. It is so true. And sometimes we're embarrassed by it. You know, sometimes we feel like we need to apologize for it. But the fact of the matter is, you know, when we look back over history and we see who God chooses and whom God calls and who he decides to use, he oftentimes will go to someone who is weak or is small as David was a small man, as opposed to Saul, who was a man that would impress the people and his head and shoulders above everyone else that was there. But David was the man who was after God's own heart. And David, ultimately, in the end of it all, was the man who stayed true to God, and Saul was not. So that oftentimes what God chooses and what man chooses are very different, but they're, and that God doesn't do that for what you might think are the reasons. He does it because in the process of selecting the weak, he makes it very plain that it is he who is doing the work. Now, I have over the years had occasion to witness and to work with and to see a lot of ministers who I would say fall in the category of the weak and the base and the foolish and the despised of the world. I have seen some of them turn out to be incredibly effective and loved and appreciated by the people they serve. I have seen others of them turn out to appear to be nothing but buffoons, to be embarrassing, to be a frustration to the people they serve and the people who are responsible for them. What do you reckon is the difference? What do you reckon makes the difference between those ministers who are two ministers, both of them who are weak to start with, one of whom becomes effective and loved and appreciated, the other one an object of jokes, a buffoon, and despised by all concerned? I think we might want to ponder on that a little bit as to how it happens that one or the other of these avenues is followed by the individual's concern. You see, because in many cases, from where you sit right now, you may not have the foggiest notion of what this person that you're looking at who's speaking up there was at one time in his life. You may not know where the weaknesses are. You may not know where the flaws in the armor are. And in truth, they are not even relevant. Not to you. But it is interesting to ponder why it is that some men, and you see, they have to realize that even many men whom you don't think of as being weak are men that God thinks of as being weak and were chosen because of, not even in spite of. This is what you think of. Well, God, he's weak, but God chose him in spite of his weaknesses. Oh, no. He chose him because of his weaknesses. But you may never know about him. The person you're going to know about is you. You're the, you're the one that's going to know about your weaknesses. You're the one that's going to know about your problems. The question is whether or not 
everyone will know, or whether or not you are the only one who will know. And you know, it's a, there is a reason why these things come out and result the way they do. In a minute, we're going to talk about that a little bit just today. He goes on then to say, You see your calling, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. We used to have a joke in college about that sort of thing. Uh, there aren't many wise men called, uh, not many, but boy, there are few. And here we are in college, we're the elite, you know, this is, uh, we joked about it. I'm afraid we wasn't always that much of a joke. Uh, you know, some of the people actually had some, some uh, sincere, sincere meaning by it. I thought, well, I am one of the elite that we're, we're called. We used to bandy that around a little bit. The trouble is, when you get in the prayer closet, it's kind of hard to joke with God about it. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. Was there an objective in this? Oh, yeah. That no flesh should glory in his presence. And you know, the real end result of what, which, which, which channel, let's say, that you as a, a weak and effective, ineffective person whom God calls and decides, I want you to go and give a message, the channel that you wind up in boils down on this one verse, your acknowledgement of that weakness, your acceptance of that weakness, and the responsibility of God to make something out of what you do, if anything, is to be made of it at all. And to whatever extent you think that you amount to something, it'll put you in the channel in which people will say, whatever made that man think that he could preach. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. As a preacher, it is Jesus Christ who turns out to be my wisdom. It is Jesus Christ who turns out to be my righteousness if I appear to be in some way righteous before you. It is Jesus Christ who is my sanctification, who is the one who may have set me apart. It is Jesus Christ who is my redemption. That according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Nothing could be said more important than that. And the failure to accept it, the failure to acknowledge it, the failure to understand it is at the root of the failure of of just about everyone who ever fails as a minister of Jesus Christ. The failure to glory in the Lord rather than glorying in himself. Brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul said, I, you know, the implication of this is almost as though Paul came to them at a lower level than he was capable of doing. <clears throat> it's hard to grapple with that. But one suspects that that is true. That he himself was a brilliant man. No one could possibly deny for a moment the brilliance of Paul. He certainly had to be aware of, of, of his mind, of his capabilities, for he was a student. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. A brilliant man. He says, now when I came to you, I did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I've heard that, that phrase, in my lifetime from some of the worst examples of arrogance I could ever possibly name. I've seen preachers get up with a great show of humility and say, Now I have determined not to know anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I think, well, you arrogant so-and-so. For he has now taken pride in his humility. And if you ever make that do that, you know, I remember that's one of the early lessons that I learned. Because in Ambassador College back in the early days when I was there, a lot was made out of humility, about humility. You know, you're supposed to be humble. And of course, faculty members took it upon themselves, see to it that you got kept humble in many cases uh, by whatever means they could possibly do. And I know we prayed a lot about humility in those days. You know, we had reason to. All of us did. We were just really able people. You know, and really able people like we were had to be careful about vanity and pride, so we had to work at being humble. And so I worked at it. And I'll never forget the day when I really did experience a genuine feeling of humility and a genuine awareness of humility in the instant I realized that I was proud of it. And the instant I was proud of it, it was gone. 
It's, a, it's astonishing to know, but it is, it is right there. It is with you at all times. He said, I, he said, I had to come in here and I had to determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. There is no more difficult lesson that you will ever face if you're going to be a preacher than to be able to get up in front of people and to forget about yourself. Uh, you know, you've heard that before, haven't you? You've heard people talk about that before, haven't you? You know it's important, don't you? But do you have any idea how hard it is to do? Because you know that dry mouth is because you're thinking about yourself. That little nervous sweat is because you're thinking about yourself. That difficulty in remembering, remembering where you are, that's because you're distracted and it's usually by yourself. The truth is that it is so difficult for a speaker when he gets up in front of a group of people to so clearly and definitively focus on those people that he crowds himself out of his mind. This is what Paul is trying to tell you. He's trying to tell you that when I got up here, I had to work at being so full of the gospel and what I was trying to say and the people to whom I was trying to say it that there was no room in my mind for myself. Now, you can forget where you are because you got so involved in a line of reasoning. That's, that happens. There's nothing wrong with that. You can be so involved with your audience and communicating an idea for your audience, you forget what the next thing was you wanted to say to them. That's why we use notes <coughs> to see to it that you don't get just totally lost and are able to find your way back to what it is you're doing. But the Apostle Paul is trying to help us to understand this awareness of Jesus Christ and not knowing anything except that the message and the people. The message and the people is the thing that a, that, that a minister, a preacher, has got to, to crowd everything else out of his consciousness except the message and the people. And I was with you, he said, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. But I want you to understand, it wasn't because Paul lacked confidence in, 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 in speaking. It wasn't, it couldn't possibly have been because he lacked confidence in his message. It was the responsibility that was on his shoulders that caused Paul to feel the way he did. And I think also possibly physical debilities as well. He said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of the power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, I want you to mark that scripture in your Bible, number verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 5. I want you to remember the context of it. I want you to memorize it and plant it in your consciousness. Because if you are going to preach, if you're ever going to stand up in front of people, one of your objectives at all times, apart from your primary objective of a concept, an idea, a feeling, a response on the part of your audience, is this verse, their faith must not stand in the wisdom or cleverness or skill of men, but in the power of God. For it is only the power of God that is going to relieve people of their fears, take away their dreads, help them to overcome their problems, their habits, their, their, their sins, to overcome the devil. <clears throat> it's not going to be your skill as an orator. It's not going to be some method that you give them that you explain, well, now, if you'll do this, and if you'll do uh, B following A, and if you'll do C following B, then this result will inevitably come to pass. The answer does not lie in a person. The answer does not lie in a method. It lies in the power of God. As a preacher, this is something you can never, ever allow yourself to get rid of. Actually, as I said, the striving for excellence in preaching, while it is admirable, it's laudable, it's something we have to do. It is a way that is strong with landmines because it is so for easy to forget why you're there. So easy to forget what you're doing. So easy to become self-involved rather than people-centered. And really, it's only partly because of the ego of the preacher. Now, that ego of the preacher is a very real problem. It's especially so among newer preachers who, who do not have the experience, the background, the length of time behind them. Ego is a big problem. It is primarily because of the distortion of faith in the hearers that we must concern ourselves with this. For your ego is your problem, but the distortion in the faith of your hearers is their problem. 
and it has suddenly become their problem because of you. I don't think many of us who stand up to speak really adequately appreciate the responsibility that falls on our shoulders when we do so, the enormous responsibility. Oh, you're not responsible for everything that people do. I mean, they've got to share their, carry their share of their burdens for their mistakes and their flaws. But you see, suddenly, you have moved right in alongside of them. And that is a serious matter. Jesus said, woe unto the world because of offenses. It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him by whom the offense comes. Now, you see, a lot of you out here who've never given a sermon, never will. You would think if I'm going to be talking to people about preaching, about being a preacher, that turning to a scripture about false prophets is a strange place to go. It's almost though like we're going to teach you how to be a false prophet? No. But in the understanding of the condemnation of God for a certain type of preacher, each of us may ourselves be warned, might we not? Jer Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 1. <clears throat> Woe be to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people. <clears throat> you have scattered my flock, you have driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Now there is a very simple admonition, thank you, that comes to men who might be in God's service trying to do God's work. It said... Woe to you who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. You have scattered my flock, you have driven them away, and you have not visited them. Now, I know I'm talking to men who have jobs, careers. You have lives to lead, and the time that you are able to give to the ministry and to the church is a little bit limited. But, of course, truth to tell, Ted and I are in the same category. We have jobs. We have jobs at the Tyler office. We have a, a work week that we carry through all the time of, of uh, trying to get, or get administrative things taken care of, of planning for the work and, and implementing our plans, trying to help the work grow. So in one sense of the word, we're not just like you are. We have a job over here, and then on the weekend, we have a responsibility to preach, to teach, to exhort to people. I've been in the ministry for a long time. And when I first began to speak, I was a student in college, and I'd be going out to local churches around the area to preach. And back in those days, I had a certain amount of difficulty in deciding what to preach about. You know, what do I do my sermonette on this week? And uh, a lot of times in college, we would exchange ideas, and we'd work on things, and so we'd get these, these fairly set sermonettes, which were really for the purpose of training. But then I got my first field pastorate, in Little Rock in Memphis back in 1961, I guess I went out to, uh, to Little Rock in Memphis. And, of course, the first thing you start doing right off the bat, this is your job as a minister, is you throw your sack lunch in the car and your wife, and if you had kids, your kids in some cases, and you head off down the road to the nearest member to visit. And you ring the doorbell, and, hi, I'm the new minister, and, well, it's wonderful to see you. And back in those days, it really was, because... Those people were scattered, and they hadn't seen a minister in ages and ages and ages. And the idea of having someone who cared enough to come to their door, well, that was terrific. And there was never any problem in those days about having your visit welcome. And I, well, I was welcome with open arms. I drank so much coffee because you always said to be sociable, you know, that I was floating away with it at times and get a little fidgety because you couldn't sleep at night. But we'd visit in one house and another and another. And oftentimes you could get in, you know, three pretty good visits, and sometimes four in an afternoon and evening, and uh, then you get on down the road. So you get in somewhere in the average around 15 visits a week. I found that when I got to the Sabbath service in time for Friday night, when I began to put my, my final preparations on myself, I had no problem at all knowing clearly what to speak about. It was, it was an, an interesting experience for me at the time as I suddenly realized what, why my trouble had been before. I was not in touch with the people that I was going to be speaking to. And it's almost impossible to be effective as a speaker without visiting. Not necessarily a visiting program of going to people's homes, but without visiting. Sitting down after church, sitting down before church, uh, talking on the phone, whatever it is you have to do. But as a speaker, you're going to have to look for that flock. These men, God said, drove them away. And they didn't even take the trouble to call them on the phone. They didn't take the trouble to go visit them, you know, to spend time with them, to try to know these people. God then talks about other things having to do with the future, but in verse 9 he says, My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. 
All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and a man whom wine has overcome because of the Lord and because of his holiness. For the land is full of adulterers. You know, you look around you. You know, watch television. And what are you seeing? You know, you're seeing people living together. We used to call it shacked up. It used to be a term you didn't need, you were afraid to use almost in polite conversation. But now it's very common. Uh, you see little threesomes living together. You see uh, people, uh, homosexuals living together. You see the, the byplay of, of people going from bed to bed to bed to bed and thinking it's very normal. And it's just around you everywhere. Would anyone argue that our land is full of adulterers and fornicators? Well, this description fits our land. But you see, God connects it up with the preachers. He says, my heart is broken because of the prophets. The land is full of adulterers. Is there a connection between the two? You'd better believe there is a connection between the two. But because of swearing, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil. Their force is not right. Both prophet, that's the preacher, and the priest are profane. In my own house, I have found their wickedness, saith the Lord. You think that the possibility of finding in God's own church a certain amount of wickedness among preachers might be a possibility? Count on it. And maybe sometime you don't have that far to look. He said, Yea, in my house I have found their wickedness, saith the Lord. And I'm reading this to you right now because I think it's time, you know, there's never a time when we as preachers should not be aware of the fact that of all the people in the church that the devil would most like to compromise, it's you. The one that's going to get up and then begin to influence people in the church. Why do you reckon that? Because after all, just because he's got you to do something wrong doesn't mean you're going to get somebody else to do something wrong, does it? <clears throat> we'll come back to that. Wherefore, and this to me is one of the most frightening scriptures in the Bible. Now, there's no reason why it should frighten you people who are not preachers. But it frightens me because it says concerning preachers and priests, who actually are, as he said, wicked and even in the house of God. Their way shall be as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. I have seen folly in the prophets, the preachers of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal. They caused my people to err. So he's looking at the preachers up there who went after other, other religions entirely. I have also seen in the preachers of Jerusalem a horrible thing. Now, here were people who had not divorced the, the worship of God. You see, the prophets of Samaria, well, they were keeping a feast in the 15th day of the 8th month. They had even apparently, for all intents and purposes, changed the Sabbath by this time. Although that could be argued, but there's every indication that they had done so. And they had followed Baal and Ashtaroth, and they'd gone off on, on these other things. But the prophets in Jerusalem were keeping the Sabbath. They were keeping the holy days. They were still right there in God's house at Jerusalem. I see a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. Just lie habitually. It's a sobering concept. Why does it happen? How does it go and come, turn, to, turn out that way? I think it has something to do with the sins, the need to cover up those sins, the fact that sometimes you are living a lie on a day-to-day -day basis, it makes it very difficult for you to be honest in a lot of parts of your life. They strengthen the hands of evildoers that nobody returns from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. You know, it's not difficult, is it, for you to figure out how that a preacher who has had an affair would have a hard time condemning that same conduct in his congregation, isn't it? Therefore, the connection is easy to make between one who strengthens the hands of an evildoer, right? That's not hard to figure. But there is another side to that coin that I don't think you may, you may not have considered. What about the preacher who has sinned and still feels guilty about that sin and in trying to punish himself for his own guilt lashes out at that sin in the congregation? Could that happen? Could it get to the place to where he beats down his people, that he condemns his people because he himself is condemned? Sure it is. I'm not so sure, but what that latter error is greater than the first. He goes on then to say, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, the preachers, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood, 
I'll make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, the preachers of Jerusalem, is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Don't listen to the words of the preachers that prophesy or preach to you. <coughs> they make you vain. They speak to you a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say to them that hate me, well, the Lord has said, you're going to have peace. They tell people that don't like God, that don't respect God, that don't respect God's law or his way. They say to those people, you're going to have peace. They say to everyone that walks after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Well, let's so bring scripture. Now, this is also the same scripture in which we learn that where God says that if these preachers, these preachers that God said, I didn't send them, I didn't call them, but if they had caused my people to hear my words, even they would have turned them away from the wickedness of their doing. When I finally noticed that, it's down in verses 21 and 22, I was absolutely astonished by it. And I, it finally, at one time in my life, made me understand something I had never really quite grasped. And that is the change that has taken place in the United States and Great Britain over the past oh, couple of centuries, really. It's been going on for quite a long time, but mainly the last hundred years. Because you see, when this nation was founded, it was founded on the principles of the Bible. It was founded on the principles of God's word. And even those old preachers back in the old days whom God may never have spoken one word to in all of his life, who would, God would not recognize them if he saw them on the street, that God says, who is this man? But this man took a Bible and he got on a horse and he went riding off down the road and he got in front of a bunch of people and he rolled open the Bible and he began to preach the things that were in the Bible. And he condemned the sins of the Ten Commandments. He actually held up these principles. He railed and ranted about it all. And who knows what his own life was. But he preached that book and he went on down the road and God says, my word will not return to me void. If the Bible gets out there, it will have an effect. And our nation in its earlier years was a moral nation. It was a nation with standards of conduct. It was a nation that knew God, that knew about God at least. They may not have known all there was to know about, but he knew he was up there. He knew he cared about what they did, and he knew he'd punish them if they did bad things, and they were afraid of that. Who do you reckon did the most damage to all that over the years? Do you think it was the evolutionists that did the most damage to it? Do you think it was the scientists who did the most damage to it? No, no. It was the preachers who did the damage. It was the preachers who said, oh, no, well, don't worry. God will be patient with you on that. God won't punish you for that. You will have peace even no matter what you do. I could go back and, and recount uh, at great length all of the uh, ramifications, if you will, of the movement toward demythologizing the Bible, as some of them put it, the uh, uh, God is dead movement more recently in Great Britain and some of those things were among, and this all was taking place among clergymen. Of course, I got to the place where Allie and I were joking about this year over in England, and we thought that the, the, the uh, clergy in England drew straws every year to see which one of them would make some pronouncement prior to Easter to stir up a lot of controversy to get the church in the news. <clears throat> it's almost that way. Every year before Easter, there's a big crisis in England's church, and it's on the front page of all the newspapers. And then toward the end of it all, right after Easter, the preacher is mollifying it all and, and recommitting to the faith and showing how much he believes in God and so forth. And, I, you know, you get the feeling they're just playing a game. I don't know if that's what's happening or not. But in any case, the, the awareness of the damage that preachers have done to our whole world around us is profound. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because you're not a bit better than they are. Some of you, I mean, none of us really are. We're not, we're not any more moral people than they are. We don't have anything better going on inside of us than they do. We have one thing, and one thing only, and that's a dedication to God's Word. And then we can even say to ourselves, well, I, I hope that God has called me to preach. I believe that God has called me to preach. But I also at the same time believe that I, as one called to preach, if it's necessary for a man who hasn't called to be faithful to his word to get any results, well then surely I who am called must also be faithful to his word if I'm going to have any results. Faithful to God's word. This is the critical thing. By the way, did anybody catch the exact moment we started? I'd like to make these about one hour in length. Did you happen to get it, Lewis? Okay. About ten minutes to go. Okay, I want to talk now for the next 10 minutes about the desire to preach. Because this is something that gets into people, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people you don't even know about at a very early time. Paul said to uh, Timothy, he said, Now if a man desire the office of a bishop, which is, of course, the office of an overseer in the church, but probably is a preaching office, 
says he desires a good thing. Nothing wrong, really, with that. Remember back in the old days, the freshman class would come in, about this size mine was, I guess, in Ambassador College back in those days, and maybe a little larger. Now, how many of you people came here because you wanted to be in the ministry? You know, and they'd all put up their hand. You know, everybody would go, he said, well, get that out of your mind. Mr. Armstrong had nice jowls he could shake, you know, and, and rattle, and absolutely thunder and rattled away after. Everybody jerked down their hand. And for the next four years, everybody would go about pretending they didn't want to be in the ministry anymore. And, uh, you know, got everybody, uh, you know, making them realize his point was that you've got to be called to the ministry. But it kind of created a very artificial atmosphere among everybody concerned because it caused them to de deny something that was going on inside of them, and that was a desire to preach. Now, there's nothing wrong with that desire, and there's, it is all very well and good if. Now I want to discuss with you a few ifs. If, number one, it is all well and good if you are called by God. How do you know that? Now, I tell you, that's a tough one. I can recall the first time I believed that God had called me to the ministry, and I was a Baptist at the time. I wasn't in the church at all. I don't know whether that was a calling from God or, or, or a human desire to influence the behavior of others, which can actually be manipulative and a desire to control. I also know, though, at the same time, there was within that, that a desire to help, a feeling that I could change people for their good, not just for mine and not just for my gratification, that those feelings were there. And I don't know, you know, where that feeling went or what happened to it. Except that I do know that when I got to Ambassador College, you know, it was that same feeling was still there. Whether it was related to whether I was having that feeling toward the same God or not, I will not discuss the theological implications of that. I just still felt that way when I got to Ambassador College. But I knew that God had to call me, and I could not do it myself. I could not make that decision on my own. There was never a point in time where I heard a voice in the prayer closet that said, Ron, you're going to preach. Never happened never happened. You know how I came to understand, how I can stand here before you today and tell you I know that I was called to preach? The reason I can tell you that today is because I know God gave me the gifts of a preacher. Now, I know that. And the reason I know it, I will engage in a little self-disclosure here, is because I am a lazy person. When I got into college and I took my classes, I worked as hard as I needed to. And since I'm not just real dumb, I didn't have to work all that hard to get done what needed to be done. So when I would go into speech class, I would do what I had to do. You know, I would do as much preparation as I had to do to get the speech given. I would do as much preparation as I had to do. Now, the teachers would get up there, and they'd tell you all these things about vocal exercises. Vocalize. You get up in the morning, you vocalize. You do your all of your tongue twisters, and you do this. You go through this routine, and that routine. Never did any of that never so much as lifted a finger to do it. Somewhere, somehow along the line, God gave me certain gifts that I have got. I did not earn them. I did not practice for them. I did not struggle for them. I did work at them. But they are not acquired by anything that anybody was able to teach me. They have been honed by experience. And that's one of the things that uh, cannot be substituted for. Because by the time I even got to Ambassador College, I figured once that I had given something in excess of 200 public speeches already because of high school and college speech and so forth elsewhere before I ever came there, and also because of certain training uh, things that I went through in the Navy. So I had <clears throat> given a lot of speeches. So when I went into Ambassador Club and began to speak, I was better than most of the fellows that were there because I had done 200 of them, and some of them gave the first speech in their life in that club when I was there. And we were all sitting there trying to trying to participate as equals. Now, I wasn't personally better than they were. And over the years that followed, a lot of those guys worked harder than I did at what they were doing. But they still were not called to the ministry, and God never gave them the gifts that go with it. And now somehow, along the way, there are two people, or two categories of people, that have got to be convinced that you're called to the ministry. The first person is you. You're the first one. You're, you're the, you should be the first to know, right? Sometimes it isn't so. Sometimes you're not the first to know. It is oftentimes the case that the minister who is working with you and knows you begins to recognize it before you do. 
This is often the case in college. We could see it. Most of the men who were there wanted to be in the ministry in one way or another. But it was those of us who taught them speech and taught them Bible who could see. You could, it's almost like the opening of a flower. Those individuals that God had called to be his ministers and those whom he had not. Now, you could argue that all you were seeing was the development of natural abilities, that natural abilities that went into the ministry or natural abilities that didn't, and I would have a hard time refuting you know, that argument. It's irrelevant. The argument is irrelevant because the truth to tell, there are differences in people, there are differences in the way they develop, and whether it has to do with natural ability or the call of God, the result is exactly the same. One group should be in the ministry and the other should not. So we, we'll argue the theological implications of it and how it works some other time. My point is that you had better, at some point in your life, if you're going to be called upon to speak to God's people, sit down, go to a private place, kneel down before God, and say, God, do you really want me to do this? Is this something I really ought to be able to be doing? Do I have the legitimate, genuine fear that ought to go with any preacher wherever he goes? And I don't mean the fear of embarrassment. I don't mean the fear of making a mistake. I don't mean that fear, all these fears, let's line them up over here, that are for yourself. I'm talking about the fear of the responsibility for other people's lives. If you don't have that fear, you're not going to be worth anything in the ministry. Because I've seen an awful lot of men who wound up in the ministry who callously would proceed full steam ahead and walk right over I mean, so many things in people's lives and their approach was, well, you know, God will take care of it or these people, well, that's their own responsibility. They'll have to do it. I've just got to preach it like it is and never, ever consider what it means. I'll give you a small illustration. When I was a pastor of the Birmingham Church in England, I came to church one day and a member wanted to see me and he came over and he said, look, he said, I, I hate to bring this up, but I saw Mr. So-and-so ride his motorcycle to work the other day and he was smoking you know, as he rode his motorcycle to work. Now, at that time in the church, smoking was real bad. You know, it was right up there alongside of lying and, and, and cheating on your wife and things like that. And he came to me about it. And he said, I said, well, I said, well, Dave, what you do, you just keep that to yourself and I'll decide what to do about it. And I thought about it a long time. I knew the man. And I also knew one other thing. That if I got up, you know, if I, if I approached him and I said, are you smoking? I knew that he would lie to me. I knew it. Now, if I went to him and I braced him on it and he lied to me, I had a much more serious problem on my hands, didn't I? Than I would have had if I had not asked him in the first place. You know what I decided to do? I decided to say nothing to him at all because I made the decision that it was better for him, for him to be in church with me preaching to him week by week on other things than smoking, than to brace him on smoking and lose him altogether. One of the few things I did that was right you know, back in that period of time. I did a lot of ham-fisted wrong things when I was a young minister, but that's one smart thing that I did. I knew enough, I cared enough, and I feared enough about the consequences in that man's life not to do a stupid thing and to just arrogantly go straight ahead. Well, I did what was right. You know, I, my, I could have been defended it. I could have stood before Jesus Christ myself and said, well, I just went to him about his problem. But you know what he said? He said, oh, Ron, you knew that if you did, you would provoke a greater problem, didn't you? And am I going to tell Jesus Christ no? To this day, I feel right in that decision. I don't know whatever became of that man. I don't know if I'll see him in the first resurrection or if I won't. But I will know that I didn't really stand in his way over something about, like smoking, which uh, I didn't quite even then feel it was the baddest line. And that we'd be far better off to keep him in church and to keep working with him than to provoke a complete breach between me, his minister, and the man. And to the credit, absolute eternal credit, of the person who told me about that, I guess he never ever mentioned that to another human being. So, it is all well and good to desire to preach if you are called, and you are the one that's going to have to decide from your side if that is true. Now, fortunately, you know, in the church we've got a nice little defense. The defense is simply this, that if... You know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but it is awfully hard to fool all of them all the time, as the old adage goes. It is not difficult to fool the people in a church. You know, you can really fool the people in a church. You can put up a good facade, and you can have them all believing a certain thing. It is very easy to fool the minister. You know, you can, well, you can polish his boots and, 
and toady up to the minister, and you can stroke him, and you can make him believe you're such a good old boy. And that minister can read, or you can fool him. Piece of cake. I've been fooled a lot of times. But you know something? It's hard to fool the minister and the people at the same time. Tough. And that's one of the things the Worldwide Church of God never quite got around to understanding. And it's something that we, I think, hopefully have begun to understand in this church. You have got to see that you are called for the ministry. And the ministry have got to see that you are called for the ministry before you go there. Now, we will still make some mistakes along the way, you and I. And you may be mistaken about yourself, and the ministry may be mistaken about you too. But at least we're going to try to keep you from hurting yourself and to keep you from hurting other people in the process. Because that's what happens when people who have no business being in the ministry wind up being in the ministry. And to all of us who have a responsibility for evaluating prospective people, uh, it's very important that we think long and hard about that. As Paul said, lay hands suddenly on no man. Some men's sins are open. Some men's sins appear later. And he says, don't you become a partaker of other men's sins. The implication, uh, we who are ministers become responsible for you when we lay hands on you before the congregation and you subsequently begin to hurt other people's lives and hurt their lives and hurt them and hurt their families and so forth. It's a very, very sobering thing to consider. The desire to preach is all well and good if you are called. And it's all well and good if you are gifted. Gifted. You know, you've got to have certain things if you're going to preach. You just absolutely must have it. You must have a decent voice. You know, you've got to have a voice that will carry so that people can hear you. If they can't hear you, they're, they're, they're straining, they're working, they're distracted, and they're not able to just walk with you through a sermon that you're going to walk through it. You have got to have the ability to put together a flow of words. There are some things that can be taught, and there are some things that I'd have never figured out a way to teach. You know, I know that we can teach sentence construction. Uh, we can teach grammar. Uh, we can teach all sorts of technical aspects of, of this type of thing. But I've never been able to teach somebody who really is not fluent in, 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 with, with a good flow of words. I've never found a way to get them to be able to be that way. Now, I don't mean to say that, that some people who are, have disfluencies in their speech cannot be helped. Oh, they certainly can't, because those disfluencies are often caused by inhibitions. In other words, it's this, this, this fear of criticism, a fear of making a mistake, the fear of embarrassing yourself. People get up and they hesitate and they stammer and they stumble. Well, you can help people with that. Probably the most help you give them is experience, and that's why we have sermonettes in the Church of God International. Some people can say, why don't you do away with those sermonettes? What's the use of these sermonettes? Come on, how are we ever going to get any experience? I have watched young men come along through an awful lot of years now who were awful when they started out, and it was only in the accumulation of experience that they became very good speakers and very effective in changing people's lives. And an awful lot of them came, even more of them came, to a degree of competence, even though they weren't great speakers, to a, to a degree of competence and respectability that was able to complement a personality which was beautiful in working directly with people one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, don't worry about the fact that you are disfluent. To whatever extent those come about because of inhibitions or fears or problems, we can help with that. Experience helps with that. The question, though, is, and you all know it, there are some people who have a gift of being able to speak, and there are some people who just flat do not. Some people just don't have the command of the language, and are too old, frankly, by this time in their life to ever get the command of the language. And so consequently, they should be content, because God has not gifted them in such a way that they can speak. One of the parables tells us, it tells us in the simplest possible terms, that when God, the time came for God to hand out his talents, they were given to every man according to each one's several abilities. In other words, God did not take a person who had no ability and give to him a certain set of talents, that the talents were matched to the natural native ability of the individual concerned. So if you want to know something about your own gifts, one of the first places you ought to look is at your ability. What is there because you were born with it? Or if you weren't born with it, you developed it as a boy or a young teenager, and you've come to adulthood with a certain style. If that style is not such that the gift of God can be laid over that style and used to preach, forget it. Forget it. 
God is going to give you a different gift. And if you want a clue as to what God's gifts to you are going to be, look at you. Just go look in the mirror. Take a good long look. Think back over your life and think about those things that you came to adulthood that God had already put in you and your genes, your family, your background, and your experience and brought you here with that because that's where it's going to come from, right there. Okay, let's take a five-minute break and let's make it a real, everybody check your watches, and a real five-minute break and come back in and be in your seats in five minutes and we'll go on with the next portion of the seminar.